Yeah, I help organizations implement bureaucracy. That's, um, that's all we do with organization builders. And I think it's what Daniel says. You guys are on this journey for a long time already. That makes probably your job easy. That makes my job typically more difficult. <laughs> Implementing holacracy in a very hierarchical organization is very easy because it's easy to see the shift, the difference from what they used to and what's them coming. Um, so with Grantree, that will be a bit more of a discovery, and uh, uh, that's why we set up the days in uh, in this way to start with uh, with the simulation. Um, I typically plug in my laptop and going to give an explanation of what holacracy is, but given that Andrew has done this probably uh, a couple of times already, right? Yeah. Um, why don't you tell me what holacracy is? And then I see what I have to add to it. Tell us who the third person is drilling into what holacracy is. System of governance and decision making? Yeah. Let's try that right there. Confidence and decision making. What is it? What, what have you read about it? What do you know that holacracy uh, is? Come on, guys, I'm school. <laughs> <laughs> also, I pull up my presentation. Uh, uh, it's a set of tools that help us achieve self management and to help us clarify on roles and accountability. I guess it's just part of it. Yeah, I like the tool part of it, right? It's more like a hammer. You can hit it on anything, right? Uh, <laughs> so the question is, where do you want to hit it on? It's just a set of tools. A way of organizing the work rather than people. Yeah. And how would you explain it? What's the kind of analogy that kind of so I, I completely agree with it, but what does it mean? What does it mean to you? Hierarchy of roles rather than people. Yeah. And um, the analogy I typically make is with, uh, with the human body. Like, my head doesn't tell me how my liver will function, right? If my, my head slows down for a week, my liver starts keep functioning. So each of those organs are, are, are part of the, of the bigger body, right? You cannot take out the liver and kind of have it do their own thing and go apart from, uh, from your body, but there's no central control system that tells how each of those organs work. So we organize work, we, make, we take care of the organs, kind of do their own thing, but we don't interfere, we don't interfere with how, the, uh, how, how each of those organs do their work from, uh, from your head, from your central uh, control system and stuff like that. It's not a centrally controlled mechanism. Why don't we organize work instead of people and then uh, uh, Make sure that uh, the whole system kind of works together. What else? A way to enable everyone to participate in designing how the, the organization works. introductions about election people ask like hey wait I'm the, the boss I'm used to have power here I used to make decisions can I make less decisions now when we do this no <laughs> we don't want to make the boss less powerful we want to make everybody as powerful as the boss else it else, uh, else it scares all those old bosses away typically if you and they used to be able to make decisions, they were entrepreneurs for probably a good reason. If that power is taken away, it kind of gets to a soft form. So Alacracy wants to get everybody as powerful. Within the scope of the stuff you, you do. And, uh, uh, and, then, and then hopefully this fosters that participation. Let's experiment with that. Let's see how that actually works. Because this sounds like philosophical and like, oh wow. Let's see if it works. <laughs> And typically, guys like Daniel only give up the power if other people step up. <laughs> they won't let go at first and then see if other people pick it up. And that this happened. <laughs> <laughs> so it's more an invitation for everybody to step up and take that power than it is for them first to, to let go of it, typically. That's how I see it work most of the times. But if they, if they hold on to it, hey, then... Uh, then my role starts to play and I should uh, coach them a bit on that, but uh, yeah.
let's first make clear how we organize work and then uh, yeah, get that participation. What else? What else do you guys know already about holacracy or? It's amazing how quiet everybody is. Like, <laughs> how long have you been? Uh, <laughs> been uh, <laughs> Six months. <laughs> I'll pop up, I think I have a few more slides or two to explain a bit of pieces about uh, holacracy additional to this. Then I want to get you into a, a simulation about holacracy, that you experience it. Typically works a lot better than to, uh, to talk about it uh, or continue talking about it. Um, yeah, do you want to get that up about how long is that up? Yeah. It's just HDMI, right? Yeah. <coughs> And no one is allowed to talk while the laptop is being set up. <laughs> <laughs> that was a joke. <laughs> Not an order. interact with each other. And here the rules are you can walk to a red light as long as you look a bit left and right. Uh, I look both ways to so know from which side the traffic is coming. But and you, you create a set of rules so you trust that everybody can find a way around and that stuff uh, happens. Uh, and it's about self-organization. So it's, a, it's an alternative to what you're used to with the management hierarchy. Um, so this is what all for me does in a, in a single sentence. So what's then behind? Let's let's look at a few of the differences. And and I guess based on your history, you are on, on this track already for a long time. So the first one is uh, we talked about this. We are going to organize work. I like the organs in your body. Um, let let's make clear who is accountable for what, and trust they get that work done there. We will organize work, not the people. Um, yeah, so from organizing people power to organizing purpose. Right? 
what you will hopefully see is that the work we organize is kind of goal oriented. There is a purpose, a mission in it, what you want to achieve in each circle, in each role. And then people typically find their way around across the work that, uh, that is to be done in an organization. Uh, uh, the second one is <coughs> instead of a chain of command through which authority is delegated, I kind of give you the keys. If you fill a role, we say, okay, you're accountable to get this done. Here are the keys. Go and drive as fast as you can. A DFRI. Try, try to go as fast as you can instead of go until the eh, go until what is delegated to you. Um, it's nice, and then, uh, uh, then you can go as fast as you can. So we, there, that comes a bit in return, and you get those keys of uh, of that very fast car. Um, but in return, we want some visibility of what's going on. And so with Tolacracy, we also introduce a tool where we use Glassbrook to start with, where you can see at any point in time who's accountable for what and what the roles are in the organization, what work is going to happen. So you have a sort of project board where you can see role by role what they're working on, what kind of outcomes they're, they're after. Um, and we also look at metrics. How can we kind of visualize, make transparent how we're going? Uh, is the organization doing, get that kind of transparency. Because um, if you would do this without the transparency, what's going wrong? Or why would it be tough? If you would just say, hey, here are the keys, good luck. There's no way that's even worked, I don't know. Sorry. Same thing. So go ahead. So you would no way of actually knowing if people are working, if these things are going on or not. It's hard to align, right? Mm -hmm. And we tried uh, self-steering teams in the 80s, and they kind of, hey, here's the steering wheel, good luck. So where's that organization in it, right? If everybody steers to a different direction. Mm -hmm. So that's what we try to combine now. Okay, here are the keys. You have the authority to act. You can go as fast as you want within this role. <coughs> and let everybody know what you're doing, how things are going, so we can, we can kind of keep each other track. Um, so the next is... Um, We'll make sure what the lines of the road are. And it's kind of a bureaucracy. If you, if you want to go as fast as possible, it typically makes kind of sense on the road to, to paint some lines, to say, well, here we drive on the left, and then you can actually make some speed. If those lines on the road were not there, and those additional rules, it would be kind of hard to drive very fast. Right? How would you know where your other traffic would be? How safe would you be driving 100 miles an hour? So with all accuracy, we're trying to introduce uh, an additional set of rules, we call them policies, that you would see like lines on the road that make it safe enough to, to drive as fast as you want to go. Uh, if I tell you in this room you can do whatever you want, who will start throwing tables around? Who will start with it? Yeah? <laughs> and who will dance on the table? What, uh, uh, so typically you introduce a set of policies, a set of guidelines that say, okay, you can go as fast as possible, but here are a few borders, and if you hold to them, we'll, we'll probably get to the, we'll reach that speed safely. And as soon as you find them bureaucratic, hey, that's cool, that's attention, that's, uh, let's change them. And the rules are not there to be rules, the rules are there to be meaningful, to help you uh, uh, get, get organized easily. Um, yeah, and then another thing is, we don't believe so much more in all those forward-looking plans, yeah, the, the, the five-year strategies, the, the, all those plans with um, multi-year milestones. Um, budgets are a thing we would consider in a different way, hopefully. <coughs> Where we want to get to is to, to have as much information and the ability to, to really steer when stuff happens. You need to have a vision, you need to know where you're going a bit, but do you need to plan out your five-year strategy month by month? Probably by the time you finish writing that plan, a lot changed already. So instead of planning a lot, we want to be steering a lot more. And all the time you're planning, you can probably not steer. So there's actually quite a big of a trade-off here. Um, it was every hour you spent planning the future, you could have done work based here in reality. So that's a change we also discovered during the, 
during the next month. Holacracy puts an emphasis on in the area now being able to steer dynamically. Probably you still need to do some <coughs> bit of budgeting, right? If you don't know if you make payroll at the end of the month, it kind of makes sense to, to forecast that a bit and things like that. But as much as possible, let's try to, to do some dynamic steering, to, to respond as fast as possible to the, to the stuff that's happening. Um, yeah, reorganizations, yeah. So would you run an up and go through slides? No, yeah, um, let's do, yeah. Yeah? yeah. Okay, I just wondering with, with this, um, if, if the, the much bigger focus on the sort of steering rather than the planning, is there still ways to get kind of milestones that are motivational if not you know what I mean how do you if you're constantly just focused on the now um is there something in, in the holacracy that's kind of uh captures the motivation aspect of things um so that you know when you get to places that are a little bit further away you kind of it's quite clear it's just, that's yeah so that yeah you know, I'll, I'll capture um a lot, because I can now answer from theory, but probably in one or two hours you've experienced it yourself and, and you, you might have the answer uh, yourself. So I'll keep track of the questions you have and we'll answer them probably uh, yeah. collectively uh, uh, somewhere before or after lunch. Um, there's definitely something in it. If you lose this, if you lose the, the, the three month focus or the immediate projects you're working on, you kind of get lost. That's, uh, mm. uh, let's not all sit around and wait till work appears. You can still make a bit of plans, right? That's the. Uh, I think this gets clear in the simulation uh, uh, pretty soon. Um, and I'm stuck all between the. Uh, <laughs> no, actually, I spent a good amount of time in training to drink and stuff like that. So that's all. Uh, that's all set. Yeah. Um, if you look at the organization and ask the people, hey, how did we? design the organization, if I ask an organization, can you pull up the org chart for me? They typically, typically come up with a picture of where uh, everybody sits or how, what their view is on how did they design the organization. And if you ask them, okay, what's actually happening? Uh, if I interview you, if I follow you a day around, what are people actually doing? Who are they interacting with? Who are they talking with? Who is actually making the decisions? Um, you might get a different view. And then the third view you could pull at an organization is, what's the ideal way this organization wants to work, to serve its purpose, to help its customers? And whenever those three views kind of diverge, an organization feels the need to reorganize. So let's try to figure out a new setup of the, of the organization that kind of gets these three closer together. It's actually pretty weird. Why would we need to do that, right? If uh, most, uh, most organizations have done reorganizations a year ago or two years ago, or something like that. Um, why can't we come up with something that's like, yeah, well, you don't know this, this is a Dutch one. I'll tell you, <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you in a second. Uh, so we want to get to a sort of agile governance principles that the need to reorganize like every few years can much more happen instantaneously. Whenever you have the need to, whenever you feel this kind of gets one step out of yeah, out, pulling outside, get it closer together again. Um, and the trick with all accuracies, and there's also part of the name coming from, is the, the word holon, that every time you same element. And that's this famous picture from Holland, it's called uh, the Droste Cacao. So the, if you want to make chocolate butter, this is the best brand in the Netherlands that can do that. The plant is around the corner of uh, uh, my house. And because they put the package on the package, it actually get that whole on principle inside. <laughs> Those guys figured it out like a hundred years ago. What does it say? Does it say from when it is? No, it doesn't. But that's what you can hopefully see with the holacracy. If you look at the organizations, about the circles, about the roles, how far you zoom in doesn't matter for the power you have to organize yourself. Okay? Kind of want to add to this, like um, we haven't really done like massive reorgs, but we have had changes, like for example, bringing this manager concept in, and what it feels like in Grand Trade, at least for me, even though 
I'm able to affect those changes. That is very slow and it takes a long time to go and make structural changes. And it's also something that most people don't feel like they can do. And what I'm really hoping to see with, with Holacracy is that everybody has a process to participate in this. So instead of having one big change every few months, we have like 30 small changes every month. And, that then, and 30 small changes coming from everybody who senses what needs to change in their particular area. And that's the way I see the shift there yeah. in terms of big reorgs and agile governance. Yeah, and instead of one person thinking about it, in, in, in most organizations, it's the boss, it's the manager. Now everybody can think about it and contribute to it. And each circle gets a kind of accountabilities and defines themselves within that circle how they organize it, what kind of roles they need for that. There's nobody outside that circle saying, well, to do this work in a circle, you need those roles. That's up to every circle themselves to not only do the work that belongs to that circle, but also organize it in a way that you can, uh, can do it most effectively. Um, so you kind of also have now a bit of a view where the word holacracy comes from. It's that hold on principle that however deep you look into it, it keeps the same uh, characteristics. Uh, like the Dutch figured out um, 80 years ago when they made a cacao package. Uh, uh, <laughs> it doesn't exist anymore, I have to look it up uh, someday. Yeah. yeah, I was just going to ask, so uh, with things constantly shifting rather than there being specific well, milestones for reorganization, um, how do you gauge success and over what time scales? Yeah, that's a good one. Um, So if you would use, yeah, that was it. If you would, if you would use or not would use holacracy, how would you measure success of the organization? Uh, I suppose, like with thinking again about specifically a big reorganization, you might have identified certain things that changed in the company over the past three years that didn't work for the yeah. organization in the way that it was put together now. So you kind of outgrown or something. Yeah. So therefore, you would change the organization in order to accommodate those new parameters. Yeah. But if you're constantly changing it, is there ever a point in time where you're able to say, yes, it's specifically this that has caused the change, and the, the change has been successful or unsuccessful? So does that make sense? Yeah, yeah it does. Um, so two things. I, I, I reach back to this slide because for me it's not about the reorganization, it's about the success of the organization itself. How do you guys measure if last year was a success or not? And, um, the amount of grants you set out, the amount of happy customer reviews you got. You probably have, a, have an idea about what you would measure, what you would look at to say, hey, mm -hmm. last year was a good idea. Reorganizations or changes are just a way, it's like a tool to, to get there. Um, if you do it every two years, the change might be bigger, but it's actually harder to grab back to why you're actually doing that change. Because it was something that happened over the last two years or something that kept on happening for quite a long period of time. Then it's more, but then it's more a symptom. So with all accuracy, if you if you really get in, in agile governance, you you take a single tension. And one I have now is about, for example, communication about holacracy. And we created the first holacracy implementation rule. I think we can do better in communicating about what holacracy is, or uh, over the next months. Is there someone accountable for it? If I look up the rules, probably not. Can I make that single change right now? then I can link it back to the actual tension I had. It's a small change, it's probably a single sentence in a single role, but I can tie that change immediately back to a tension, a gap I felt. Over the course of the year, that single change, tying it back to the success of the overall organization, probably can do. But those small changes solve a direct tension, and that's if you add them all up, so if you just look at the organization itself, where is it heading? Is it, is it improving? Are you doing better? Are you having more fun? And on the secondary axis, what are the incremental changes we're making? And has each, of, each one of them been, uh, been meaningful? Uh, I'm guessing, is there a, a, what I had 
in, in Michael's question, is there a mechanism to uh, continuously check in whether we are on the right route to the purpose that we've outlined, yeah. or whether um, we are kind of going as fast as we'd like to? So is there something inbuilt, or is there something that we need to create on did, top of our RFC? Did Quaker get what he needed there? Was it before we come to your question? I think, yeah, to a degree, what, what I understand what you said is um, your it's the sum of all of the small ones that essentially make that slow change rather yeah. than getting back going to move like that. Yeah. Um, I, I, yeah, I still wonder about essentially reporting on the success of each of those small changes. Um, yeah, but but I'm I'm kind of happy with that answer. Yeah. yeah. I, I can add just another thing is so all those small changes, if they're all meaningful, hey, let's make them as easy as possible to do. Right, kind of makes sense. But then indeed the second thing that I think Paulina points out to is what about the, the overall, the bigger direction? And by doing a lot of small changes, you don't want to get distracted from your, yeah, your yeah, bigger yeah. role. So are we actually on track and are yeah. we going as fast as we'd like to towards yeah. the bigger? Yeah, and I think that's where Holacracy puts in a few standardized roles that kind of safeguard that. And we, we create a, a lead link and a rep link role. Um, the secretary and the facilitator in the circle. And those roles make sure not only the, the system works, but also these kind of alignment principles uh, that, that we can trust there's at least someone accountable for it. And that if I, I will play for the next month, a very small role in your organization as a literacy coach, it's not my role to bother about that your bigger organization is going in the right direction. Uh, if, if the system should be built up in such a way that if I do the work within my role, I trust that if everybody else does that, it kind of adds up together and that there's someone else accountable for looking at that bigger picture. And if you're that person, hey, good luck, then you're accountable for that. That's uh, the lead of each circle. And, uh, yeah. and obviously, su success is like an objective measurement, right? Um, relative to yeah. the desired position. You, you mentioned your second slide was that setting strategy and five-year goals is not part of how the luxury typically worked. So uh, there seems a disparity from what you're saying now and what, what, what you said then that I, I can't quite get, get through. Yeah, let's see if we can tackle that one. Um, so Holacracy is a purpose-driven methodology. So as an organization, you have a purpose, you have a mission, you have kind of a, a north star. Like, this is why we are on the earth. If, if we were not here, what would the world be? That's kind of your purpose statement. Eh? That's kind of what you're trying to organize and, uh, and make happen. It's not, it's not really strategy, right? But it provides you with a kind of direction. Um, that's translated to a full set of roles where work is happening. So now comes in strategy. Strategy is for me a way you want to put emphasis and priorities. If, if I've been a consultant at McKinsey and the, the only thing we did was make make those five year strategies. We spent three months on, mm -hmm. on making like, oh, this is what the future looked like and you should make these decisions. And we, when we couldn't figure it out, we made, we made three scenarios. And if I would call that client up three months later and say, hey, how did the strategy turn out? Ah, yeah, sorry, we predicted it wrong. Something else happened. Mm -hmm. So that's some of the difficulties with, with those five years plans. How much analysis and brain power you put in or whatever you put in there, it's kind of hard to predict the future, to say this is what's going to happen in five years. So how Holacracy looks at strategy, if you have, if you know your purpose, if you know your mission, why should, can't our strategy be based on where we stand now and throw that forward in a, in, in, a, in a direction? Can we now emphasize, prioritize something for the next three to six months and then recalibrate? So instead of trying to predict the future, let's put all our emphasis in one direction and we might turn around three or six months later. Mm -hmm. You get much more, uh, that's also dynamic steering in your strategy. So, but that, so it's not that you don't set strategy in Mars, it's just that you, you don't project it. You, you use more strategy in the sense of a heuristic. Mm -hmm. In the sense of a... Uh, uh, heuristics, it's like um, um, uh, um, if I would say prioritize your time um, customers over internal processes. Mm -hmm. Can everybody 
think about what you would do this week and what you would do now more of or what you would do less of. And if we would do that for three months, what would go wrong? And I just want to add, like, and going back to Quick's question as well, like, um, in terms of measuring how that actually works, there is, like, each of these changes comes from a tension that somebody feels. And we trust that people in the, in the company are going to feel tensions that are to do with things that they, they see are a problem. And they're going to bring those up and suggest a change that might resolve that tension. And then they'd be able to observe whether that tension is resolved. Yeah. So, you know, with a big reorg, usually there's, like, basically a handful of people who get to decide whether the reorg was useful or not. Mm -hmm. Here, every reorg is, a, is tiny, but the person who brought up that little reorg gets to figure out, did it actually work or not? Yep. And if it didn't work, they'd probably go and do another change to try and fix it, and they'll continue to increment sure. like this, rather than just doing one big thing and waiting to see what happens yeah. six months sure. later. Okay. And uh, with those kind of strategy statements that you prioritize something over something else, Customer focused stuff is valuable, internal processes are also valuable. So, but if you have time to, to put your energy somewhere and do that then on the, the customer part and not on the internal process part, and we don't say we don't do it at all, but you kind of put your emphasis towards it. And probably in three to six months, you'll see a lot of momentum happening on your, all your customer facing stuff. And some internal process you might get tensions about, like, wait, our finance processes or our administration is kind of not in, uh, in good order. So then you want to readjust that process again. That's what you want. So even then your strategy becomes quite dynamic. And you, you do it in a way that from where you stand right now, you can put as much emphasis in the direction where you want to go, and then adjust it when you get tensions about what you did a little bit less. That kind of strategy you will then uh, probably create. Um, there's, some, there's some academic theory on um, this approach to strategy and why it is effective and probably the only really effective way to do strategy in a knowledge work context, which I will pop on the relevant channel. Um, yeah, and finally, the meetings. Um, you can hardly read an article without reading about uh, the meetings that all accuracy brings. But for me, it's really the, the final point that ties up all accuracy. Um, Typically in the early days when you start practicing on accuracy, we'll do a bit more meetings than you might be used to. But hopefully soon enough it disappears to the background. The meetings are there as a, yeah, as a mechanism to, to, to help you get organized, help to, to align within a group, um, uh, and do that in the most efficient and effective way so you then get out of the meeting and, and do work again. Um, well, accuracy introduces an operational meeting, a tactical meeting, and a governance meeting. So we create two formats with two different goals. The operational meeting, the tactical meeting, has a goal of getting alignment between each of the roles. So as soon as the meeting is over, we can do work again within our roles. The governance meeting is there to change roles. So you step kind of out of your roles and say, well, what well, system, if if we're all soccer coaches of, uh, of our own circle, it would be, we draw the diagram on the board like, hey, this is our uh, team setup at the moment. What's that the ideal setup of our team? If we go into the second half, that's what the soccer coach always does half time, right? Change a bit the setup of the team. And where is everybody accountable for? And when we get back on the field, let's play, uh, let's play another uh, uh, match. That's what you do in the governance meeting. So with those two, and uh, the reason why, uh, why would we introduce meeting formats with self-organization? And why is that actually, why is that actually, why would we introduce a meeting format? It's kind of, it's because it's so heavy-handed in all accuracy, you read so much about it, and we will spend so much time practicing those meeting formats. Why would we need a meeting format when we introduce self-organization? Something that lies on the road, isn't it? Like yeah. But if I would say, okay, guys, um, <coughs> you're the, um, uh, which, uh, the tax operations circle, good luck, have a great meeting. Why wouldn't that work? Because everyone's going to self manage in different ways. And in a meeting, there needs to be some yeah. sort of, I guess, like boundaries, mm -hmm. like the communication guidelines within the way each individual person self manages. 
and, and uh, I guess you guys can come up with that, right? And say, hey, uh, uh, you've done a lot of meetings, everybody probably knows a few that were effective and a few that were not so much. Why not still a, a, a formalized method to do meetings? Because everybody would do it differently in each of the circles, and when you bring everybody together, it'd be a bit of a shit show. Yeah. And of course, when we now organize work instead of people, people probably become part of one, two, three, five circles, and then everybody, every circle has their own meeting rhythm. It kind of takes a um, toll to be part of multiple circles, and if every, every circle operates in the same way, it kind of makes it easy to be part of different circles. And, uh, and the second thing for me is that when you used to have a manager, that manager defined the meeting agenda. And that team would spend an hour or two hours solving the manager's agenda. And then we're too much time in meetings. Now everybody can add points to the agenda. So if everybody acts up with the power of that manager, you might just get an agenda that is five times as long. And if a lot of organizations feel pain and it's in the time they spend in meetings. So that's also why I had to be able for everybody to, to put their tensions on the table. We want a lot more efficiency in, in how we do our meetings, else we'll spend all our days in, uh, in meetings. Also, the, the, the governance meetings do something that doesn't happen in a lot of organizations, which is it creates uh, like a, a feedback and learning loop for the organization as a whole. Like I was thinking of this as I cycled in, and it's like the sort of things that I think about when I cycle in, which was <laughs> like one of the things that Holacracy does is it allows you to really harness the wisdom of the system. Yeah. You know, yeah. like the, 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 through the feedback loop of the governance meetings, the business is able to learn about whether or not it has the right structure. You know, by using all of our collective intelligences, there's actually a way to kind of pull that together to make a change. So then, the, uh, I'll get a bit theoretic maybe, but uh, let's, uh, let's see. So then, if you look at three dimensions in, in how you can take, uh, uh, can take decisions, then, then one dimension is speed. If you just have a, a manager that calls a shot, it's probably pretty fast, right? You ask him something, he gives you back a decision. The breadth of the decision and the amount of people that have been involved in making that decision, it could be a challenge, right? If you want to create N speed and do that with a lot of people. And then you get consensus decisions and they take a lot longer. It's, it's hard to combine those two already. The third dimension for me is depth. How, how insightful, if you go for breath, if everybody can give uh, an opinion about it, how much depth do they provide? Uh, how much insight is in what they're actually taking? To create a decision-making process that combines those three elements. What do you mean by that? So, um, if I would do a proposal on creating a new role or something like that, I, uh, everybody can respond, what do you think? Yeah, fine, 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 fine. We created a lot of breath. Everybody could say, uh, uh, we're okay with it. But there's no depth in it. There's no real response, no meaningful contribution. Sort of. It's the more maybe the quality of the response. Okay. So to combine all those three, you will see happening in the governance process. Um, for me, it's a unique decision-making process that combines uh, speed. You can make a lot of small iterative decisions, maybe even big ones, with a lot of breath. Everybody involved. No one is left out in uh, providing uh, their response. And when needed, people can give a lot of depth, a lot of insight into their response. It's not the kind of um, uh, consensus like you need to comply or uh, you, can you can go into a lot of depth into the decision making. But let's, uh, let's experiment with that. Um, can, can, can I just, just on, the, yeah. on the meeting thing, I just wanted to say as well that um, uh, although the first few holacracy type meetings seem to be awkward for most people, there is a kind of like refreshing feeling of at having a facilitated meeting with the structure. It it's really feels quite difficult to go back to having unstructured meetings once you get used to this, this way of having meetings, where everybody is able to sort of efficiently have their protected space, where they can actually address whatever their need is, and there's a kind of 
good structure for people to provide feedback. Um, it's to the point where during the holacracy training, Pali and I started having conversations where we started to apply kind of pseudo holacracy meeting structure to our conversations because it was so much easier to make decisions about what to do. No, but it's true. Like, and we started to say, oh, well, hold on, like we don't really have roles here, but is this a valid? Okay, it is a valid objection. So how do you want to amend my proposal that this is what we're doing in a way that meets both your need and my need? And it's 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 really it's really amazing, like because compared to the normal kind of conversation where everybody is just trying to push their way through, and it just takes forever, and it's so painful, and you feel like you have to fight all the time, like push this like treacle basically. It's it just feels really refreshing. So the first few meetings usually are a bit awkward, but give it give it a bit of time, and once you really get how those meeting structures work. It, it's, it really makes your life better and like the meetings become a really enjoyable part of the, the process. So who has done yoga or is doing yoga? Can you remember your first yoga session? Hmm. It's that level of awkwardness you get initially. If you look at people who do yoga for a long time, it's gracious, it looks incredibly easy. If you do it yourself the first times, it's tough, it's clunky. At least for me it was. Uh, uh, that might be your first few meetings. Uh, go into practice. Uh, you have a few trained uh, facilitators here. Uh, I'm there for as well. And uh, you'll master this pretty quickly. But it will be awkward to start with. And uh, uh, trust the process. Trust that this will get you through decision making. And uh, uh, yeah, you will surprise where you are in two or three months' time. Um, yeah, that's, the, that's my introduction in short about some of the differences what uh, what holacracy will bring. Um, my preference is to go in uh, uh, to build a short list of questions. What kind of things you want to, to learn or get answered over the next two days? Let's recap for a few minutes. What do you guys want to get out of today and tomorrow? And then we go into the game. Just working on it. Working. And if remote people have any questions, please speak up as well. Uh, how it's going to affect my day to day, how I do my job. Glassform and like know how to use it by the end of these two days. Yes. Yeah. What is Glassform? <laughs> the, the, the system what shows everything, the transparency. It keeps the governance right. Uh, can, we, can we set up? Um, is there a, a way to monitor, like, to monitor tangible change between pre-holacracy and holacracy? There's just something I'm throwing out there, I'm not sure if we can answer it in the next two days, but just to see what impact it's had on us. What else you want to get out of those two days? When are you walking away cheering? Hey, yeah. Never expected this would happen. Ice cream. Ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. Will, will we have the whole organization in the whole? Of, like, will it look like something? We have that. Ambitious. Hey, you know. <laughs> 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 yeah, take your magic wand. What's, uh, what's the best thing that can happen over the next two days? We all know how to conduct the meetings. A big thing. Including Richard and Holder. Not turning it from afterwards. What else? What would make these two days? Uh, the best thing would be that we feel reconnected to what we're doing and why we're doing it. Like in the past. Yeah. Yeah. I would say we not be more effective, or at least can see like after being more effective like, as a company. So basically, will we be more effective, or can we see 
like an increase in infectivity. That's the that's, that's kind of more or less what I mentioned. Mm -hmm. Like, like the can we monitor tangible change between pre Is that what we mean? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I'd like to recognize when we're not doing it correctly, and so we can course correct to make sure that we are. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice. Seems, I would uh, like to uh, see, I was actually searching for videos, but I didn't find a good enough ones. Um, just to experience the kind of pleasure and smoothness of a really effective meeting. So even though we if that's possible at all, for a simulation mm -hmm. or for something, I think that would get us really... Right. And how, how we actually like embed it in, because we're obviously getting rid of like old meetings and stuff like that, and it'd be interesting to kind of map out when we're going to do these sort of things mm -hmm. across teams, across companies. Hmm. Could you just in the, the box in the station box, right? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Just get some blue tag. Check, check for the blue tag in there. I would, I, would, I would look for more remote friendly meeting practices. Yeah, yeah, more yeah. remote friendly meeting practices. Guys, like for remote people. So the. <laughs> what do you need, uh, Andrew? I just want to put your. Um... He needs blue tap. Can, can we do that afterwards? Yes, yeah, it's like it's very destructive for remote people to have yeah. lots of noise. Yeah. So the plan for these uh, uh, two days is this morning, if you and experience what the leprosy is. I brought with me a simulation, a lot of Lego to play with. We'll be a building company and apply the leprosy on that. You'll run your own meetings, you'll do work in roles. That's immediately good practice on how remote working works when you're building a, uh, building a town. Uh, we'll figure it out. Based on that we can reflect probably on a lot of these questions already. In the afternoon, so probably we, we might capture a bit of that still after lunch, but we will do a tactical and a governance meeting in that simulation setup. I mean, awesome practice kind you get the full experience, what it is to have a role, how those meetings work, what the, what the meeting format is, um, in a kind of playful way. But hopefully the learnings are, are, are in doing of the simulation. Then in the afternoon, we'll dive deep into some of the standard roles, the facilitator, the lead link. What does it take to be a facilitator of a circle? What does that lead link role still do? What it makes it different from a manager? And kind of, we, we put a new label on a manager, but is it still a manager or is it really something else? Um, tomorrow, we'll go and do it officially. So after this first experience of today, tomorrow we'll start with, hey, why actually do we want to do this? Can we not tie that to, we have this great tool, why is it relevant for, uh, for Grantree? What, uh, what do we want to get out of this? Within those circles. So I asked you, I think last week somewhere, to make a list of between 5 and 20 things you're currently doing, which you think that are valuable for the organizations. Those activities will immediately capture within rules. So hopefully by lunch tomorrow, if we pull up Glass for that tool, you will say, like, hey wait, this is Grantry. This kind of looks like the work we're doing. And if you would log into Glassrock and check your roles, you kind of could say that more or less resembles a bit of what I do. If it's 10 or 20 percent of what you do, I'm actually already happy. Because creating in two hours the sophistication, the, the complexity of how you currently work, impossible. So we create a very basic structure of roles 
that hopefully represent the most valuable, meaningful activities you currently do. And then we will use all accuracy over the next weeks to, to build it up. And based on the actual work that's going to happen on, over the, the, the weeks to come, we'll create those additional roles, rule change, or whatever is needed to, to get to a real representation of the work you're currently doing. But by the end of tomorrow, you should look into Glassfork and see Grand Tree, not some other organization. Um, and then in the afternoon, we'll spend practicing meetings again. But then, within Grand Tree, without Lego, on your real work, you're in the new roles, and see how that goes. And we'll do some elections in between, so that we know who will be facilitator, secretary, wrapping feet of those circles. So we have the full system actually fully set up by uh, by end of tomorrow. We have the core role training this afternoon, though. So do we need to know who's in the core roles actually today? Yeah. So let's do that at the end of uh, the simulation. Check who who is going to be there. Then uh, we probably have some clarity on the elected roles immediately. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but everybody. Yeah, taxi. Yeah, that's what we figured out. Now I'm uh, getting a good question. In the simulation, we also wanted the facilitators immediately practicing in that, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, so let's set it up. Um, I would say let's do a coffee break. Mm -hmm. And that uh, gets me to unpack a bit, we put up those flip charts, and uh, get back in this room. I'll set up the simulation and we'll probably do half the simulation in that room and here to fight a bit more. How long is the break? How much do you need? How fast is the coffee machine? Shoot. Come, come back at 11. 22. Oh, that's, 20, that's a really long break. Yeah, yeah. How about 10 minutes? Yeah. 10 so how fast like, can, can the coffee machine 15. make coffee for everybody? There's yeah. another coffee machine downstairs. Yeah, no, okay, that's 15 two minutes, uh, 10 to we start. Okay. Um, just Go and play the game, but at the same time, try now and then to step out of that game and then see what kind of different rules apply to that game. Because this is hopefully what all accuracy does to an organization as well. If you see working in an organization as a game, if you look at how last week or last month you interacted with different people in organizations, how you make decisions, that's what the, what the game does as well. If you read up the, the rules of the game, it defines what you can do. If you can pick up a ball with your hands or if you need to do it with your, with your foot. Have you deliberately picked the Netherlands versus the mm -hmm. versus England now? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, no. No, I haven't. No. Oh. Um, I did look for a long time to find a, a rugby picture with also orange and white, but that one was kind of... Yeah, what did you want I think you won this game. Probably. Probably, yes. So, uh, I'm actually not sure what this yeah. Probably, yeah. The English player doesn't look like he's winning there. No, yeah. Nice muscles, But this is what all accuracy should, should do. When you change the rules of the game, the game changes. In how you interact, what is allowed, what's not allowed, and how you make points. What kind of fun you see happening in the game? So see what that simulation is going to do. And how, how if you fully emerge in the, in the game, try to step out now and then, hey wait, what's actually happening? What am I doing versus what could I have been doing? And we'll practice that a lot with the meetings as well. It makes very explicit what the new rules of the game are. Um, and when you're used to play rugby and used to pick up the ball wherever you are with your hands, you kind of get the referee in your neck. That's what will happen with telepathy a lot as well. But hopefully you see your referees, your facilitators, as people that help you understand that new game. But it might take really, if, if you're good at this game, picking up the ball with your hands, and then you need to learn to play this game, it might be quite tough, right? But that's, that will be the, the learning experience. That's why you have facilitators, coaches, referees, whatever, right? Um, this is an example. Who knows Blinkist? Who has the, the app? I do. Yeah? yeah. It's, a, it's a German uh, uh, startup from Berlin. They grew from 4 to 25 people in quite a fast spirit. They make uh, book summaries. Very boring product. <laughs> Actually, it's not. It's just so many books that you're reading less than you put in the book. You want to read the whole thing. 
the way they do it is they make it available on your phone so you can read it either in 15 minutes or you can listen to it. So within 15 minutes you can absorb the insights from a book, from a management book or whatever. That makes it kind of cool. Um, here you see their organization structure developed from their initial four founders to their organization of 25. So you get a bit of a view of what dynamic governance can do for an organization. And I don't see my play button, but I guess if I press here, then... Um, uh, I'll just let it play, you'll see it pop up. So I thought it was nice to have a bit of an idea what, what those circles and roles can do. I think they start with content, tech, product and something else, like four roles which you need to, to build. Uh, if you want to make book summaries, you need someone that writes uh, book summaries, you need someone that builds it. that. Kind of very basic. Can you see them? Uh, if, uh, that was not the idea. Yeah, there it is. All right, product design, marketing. So content and tech, big work, more people. Let's make it a circle. And you diversify roles. That's not one content role, you get a lot more roles within those circles. So how many people are they now? Now they're 25. Do you work there? Can, can we focus one. on the... Yeah, that's it. Uh, so here they built an internal organization like finance, HR, they make from marketing a circle. This could still be four people, by the way, I don't know. Um, then they made marketing, they made a magazine. So they took some roles out and they moved some roles in. I hope that gets, that's, gets natural to you at some time. And the same thing, a few of roles working together. Now why don't we make a circle out of it? Organizational experts. Hiring. I like OE, Andrew, good one. Organization excellence. Yeah, I don't. <laughs> well, let's move some more circles together. Here you see hierarchy open up again, right? <laughs> so this is where they are uh, when they were 25. Ah, that's okay. So what you see in the picture that hopefully in a very natural way you saw their organization changing what was, it? what was it, week by week, month by month, quarter by quarter, in a way that it worked for them in the best way at that point in time. And then when things change, their governance also changes, hopefully in a, in a natural fashion. I'm just looking at that, I just noticed that there was you know, less than 25 roles when other stuff that I've read about holacracy seems to suggest that it's more likely that one individual person will have lots of roles. Maybe like minimum three, uh, whereas there they had less roles than people. Um, yeah, I don't know. It was just an observation. I don't know yeah. what's sort of normal. And so the, the, I think this was just for visualization uh, principles. It's okay to have multiple roles, and the tendency typically is that people have multiple roles, somewhere indeed between three and thirty. I have 25, so it's a lot of fun. <laughs> and some of the roles take a, a, an hour a week, some of the roles, like the role I have now, my client delivery role, takes days a week. To but with a totally different identity that I do that work. So you see that happening pretty soon. But holacracy doesn't say more is better or less is better. And you could just all have one role, if it works for you guys, go for it. If you fill a role, it takes up all your work. Like if you're, uh, uh, how many people on the phone with customers now and then? Because we talked about the phone service. <coughs> if you have a call center, if you guys would be 10 times as big, you could still have a single call center role. It's just one role. And if 30 people fill that full time, great, it works. At the same time, you can differentiate into a lot of small roles which takes up an hour a month. So Holacrity just allows the flexibility to do that. It doesn't say you have to, but figure out what works for you, how much detail, how much description fits you. Um, I, I, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that one of the important things to note about the roles is that they're not restrictive of what you can do. So it's not like you have your roles and your accountabilities and you're not allowed to do anything else than your accountabilities. 
you have a role, like your role and its purpose, yeah. and anything that fits within that purpose, even if it's not in your accountabilities, you can do as part yeah. of your role. And yeah. actually, even stuff that's outside of that, you can still do, and you're supposed to go and bring it up in governance to try and, and get it represented yeah. correctly to, to create a role. If it feels like it's outside your purpose, but it, it makes sense for the organization, you can still go ahead and do it, and you're encouraged to do that. Yeah. Yeah, um, so, so, indeed, it starts with do the work within your roles, do anything you like, what fits the purpose of your roles. <coughs> if there's stuff happening outside of your roles, you can trust there's someone else accountable for it. That's an awesome thing. There's always someone accountable. So the easiest thing is just hand it over to that role and let them figure it out. But, but, but so and at the same time, if there's, no limit, if there's not a line on the road that says you cannot do this, you can do it yourself. Just go and do it. So, so the roles there are not to restrict yeah. the work, but they're there to understand what other people are accountable. Yeah. So it's like the way that I think most organizations think about roles is you want to take roles on yourself because that expands the amount of work that you do. Whereas the way that Holacracy thinks about it is that you want to create roles for other people so you know who to expect what from. Yeah. So for yourself, so long as you feel like it's aligned with your purpose, you don't need to create another role. You just go ahead and do it. Yeah. It's only when you want to expect something from somebody else that you create a role or add an accountability. Yeah. So the, the majority of the time you have tensions about other people's roles, not about your own. <laughs> In the beginning you will bring up some tensions about your own roles because they're not properly described, they miss some stuff, hey, but that's in the first few months. But then afterwards, the majority of the times you have tensions about because you expect someone from someone from something from someone else and it didn't flow nicely. So you want to change another person's role. That happens the majority of the times. With your own role, it's pretty clear for you. You know what you do and it's all kind of fine. So the, uh, it's an interesting pattern you might see changing over the, the first months. Um, one of the breakthroughs at Blinkist with Allegracy was that they uh, didn't have the speech function in the app. So you could only read the book summary. And they wanted them, they had on their roadmap for a long time already to create a speech function that you can listen to it in traffic or wherever you are, right? They, they only figured out how to do it when they let go of people fixed to a single role to a single team. Because then suddenly they found out that one of the editors was a DJ at home, so they had the sound system, another person had knew a lot of artists, so they can get e easy access to people who had good speech, stuff. So, when you let go of that people fit to a single team, suddenly the opportunity to make the speech the functionality, the speech feature, was a lot easier to get. When people started contributing based on their talents, their skills across multiple circles, they got it done within a month or a few months. Uh, that was for them one of the, the, the real breakthroughs. Like, hey, wait, this is actually really working uh, uh, to, not, to not organize people, but to organize work. Because then people can contribute to much more diverse talents than you can fit in a single job profile within a single team. Yeah. 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 Y